I'd like to call this hearing to order. And uh, this is the 26th day of our hearings on the American Energy Initiative. Last week, we held a day of hearings on the alternative fuels and vehicles that focused on non-governmental perspectives. Uh, we did not complete that hearing, so today we're going to hear three governmental perspectives, the Energy Information Administration and projections on alternative fuel and vehicle trends uh, from them, the Environmental Protection Agency, which implements several rules and several fuels and vehicle programs like the Renewable Fuel Standard and CAFE Greenhouse Gas Standards for Cars and Trucks, and the Department of Energy, which heads up the federal research efforts on alternative fuels and vehicles. Among the things we hope to explore today is the proper role for the government in spurring innovation in alternative fuels and vehicles. Where the federal government is already involved, we need to monitor its progress and make revisions if necessary. Uh, for example, I believe that the renewable fuel standard created in the 2005 bill and expanded in the 2007 bill has worked well in several respects. The nation has success, successfully ramped up ethanol and biodiesel production to meet the standards. Some believe there are challenges with the RFS that require congressional review. EPA is also involved in fuel economy greenhouse gas standards for cars and trucks, and indeed we expect a final rule for light duty standards for 2017-2015 very soon. We do need to scrutinize the impact of these standards uh, what, while they are going to improve fuel efficiency and save money in that way. We know that they will also increase the price, the sticker price of automobiles, and we want to be sure that middle class Americans can still afford these vehicles. The good news is that a variety of transportation alternatives are on the table, electricity, biofuels, natural gas, propane, et cetera. Each offers its own unique mix of potential economic, environmental, or national security benefits, as well as cost and te technical challenges that need to be overcome. So I look forward to our witnesses today our, on this last panel, and uh, I will introduce them right before we will receive their opening statements. And at this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for his five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we are holding our 26th day of hearing on the American Energy Initiative. And what we'll hear from the Republican majority, I think, will be disconnected from reality, as have the other 25 previous hearings. For 18 months, the Republicans have tried to talk about energy policy without even mentioning, let alone addressing, the problem of carbon pollution and climate change. Climate change is inextricably linked to our energy choices, and sound energy policy is critical to strengthening our energy security, boosting our economy, improving our international competitiveness, growing jobs, reducing pollution, and protecting public health. We must tackle climate change and our other energy challenges together, or we will inevitably fail to achieve these goals. The Republicans' approach is like trying to make America more secure without acknowledging the threat of terrorism. It's like trying to improve our international competitiveness while pretending China doesn't exist. It's doomed to failure. And that failure has a very high price. We're now starting to get a clearer picture of the costs of unchecked climate change. The recent wildfires, drought, heat waves, and extreme weather events, even in Kentucky, are exactly the times of extreme events that scientists have been predicting and that this committee has been ignoring. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, more than 40,000 hot temperature records have been set this year. The past 12 months were the warmest 12-month period ever recorded in the United States. At the end of June, more than 100 million people in the U.S. were in areas under extreme 
heat advisories. Two-thirds of the country is experiencing drought. And last week, the Agriculture Department declared a federal disaster area in more than 1,000 counties covering 26 states, making it the largest disaster declaration ever made by the USDA. More than 2 million acres have burned in wildfires this year. A recent study by NOAA and the UK Hadley Center found that due to climate change, the odds that Texas will experience an extreme heat wave like it did last summer are now 20 times higher compared to the 1960s. According to economists at the Texas, Texas AgriLife Extension Service, last summer's drought cost Texas agriculture $7.6 billion. That's just a portion of the cost of one extreme event that was made far more likely by climate change. But instead of tackling this problem, the Republicans have refused to acknowledge it. Representative Rush and I have written to Chairman Upton and Chairman Whitfield 15 times this year to request hearings on various climate change reports and topics. We've yet to get a response. And the Republicans have done worse than just ignore climate change. They are actually pushing policies that would make it worse. The House Republicans have voted 81 times on the House floor to block action to address climate change and establish clean energy policies. The Republicans have even voted to block the EPA carbon pollution tailpipe standards, which we'll hear about today. As proposed, those standards will save consumers on average $4,400 at the pump, net of vehicle costs, as well as reduce carbon pollution by 2 billion metric tons and save about 4 billion barrels of oil. Only an extreme ideology can view these standards as a bad idea that Congress needs to stop. Mr. Chairman, 26 hearings in this subcommittee, and we continue to ignore the real and urgent problem of climate change. As Americans across this, continue, across this country continue to experience devastating extreme events, which are becoming far more frequent as the Earth warms, it's increasingly clear that th we don't have any more time uh, to waste. And I'm not going to waste any more time and yield back my 19 seconds. Thank you very much. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this, this hearing today and the follow-up with the hearing that we had last week on really the renewable fuels portion of our national energy security and standard. Um, it, it was in this hearing room in 2005 that we established the renewable fuel standard, which has credibly helped in reducing our reliance on imported crude oil. And it uh, has helped change the liquid transportation market to something other than totally a crude oil based economy. So the question is where do we go from there? We're still importing 60 percent of the crude oil to meet our needs for transportation. That's why in 2007, then again later, we continue to move the, the renewable fuel standard and portfolio even further. Uh, that's why I always this is an opportunity to take advantage of, to uh, highlight the bipartisan bill that Mr. Engel and I have, have dropped, H.R. 1687, which is the open fuel standard. And I think the hearing that we had last week really helps build on that piece of legislation because, at, you know, as I've been thinking about the hearing, and we all know there's a plentiful supply of, of natural gas available, and that's really going to help on electricity generation, on emissions and the like. Being from a coal, coal state, I have obviously some concerns that my coal will be disenfranchised, but I do believe in the competitive marketplace. Uh, if the EPA wasn't making the additional cost so high, it would still be competitive, but that's an argument for another time. On the liquid transportation front, why can't we take the uh, natural gas, move it into methanol, add methanol, add ethanol, encourage, incentivize, plead with the automobile in industry to have a one fuel standard for, uh, for vehicles, and then have real competition at the refilling stations? so that the individual consumer could go up and, and decide what is 
the best fuel at the best price and let market competition take over. As my friend said last week, we, we really have, uh, we're still constrained, and I think some of the uh, opening statements by our panelists will highlight that we are still constrained and rely upon crude oil as a base feedstock for transportation fuels. What the open fuel standard says is let's break that. We're still going to be highly reliant upon crude oil, but let's bring other feedstock, feedstocks and let the individual consumer choose, choose at the pump and, and, and fight. So I, I want to take this opportunity to highlight H.R. 1687, thank my friend Mr. Engel, who's actually been carrying this a lot longer than I was the, the, the primary sponsor. Uh, we, we appreciate the, the associations and the national defense folks who are really involved with this because our reliance on imported crude oil throughout the world and the Strait of Hormuz and we understand the firing from yesterday. So this is always a timely uh, thing to discuss. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I do appreciate having this hearing and I yield back the balance of oh, my Mr. Chairman, oh, would you mind many, yielding many, time to me? I would yield time to my friend from Texas. And I appreciate the gentleman for yielding. Um, I just wanted to point out this past weekend we had our annual energy efficiency summit in my district back at the University of North Texas. Uh, constituents are concerned about what they see as the increasing cost of electricity and their fuel bills. So this hearing is, is timely today. The uh, keynote speaker for our event was our railroad commissioner, David Porter, who uh, mm -hmm. has the responsibility for regulating the oil and gas industry in the state of Texas, and he provided a great deal of insight how Texas is leading the way in energy technologies, particularly in the alternative uh, shale formations, which are now so prevalent in our state and has been a boon to the region and much of the rest of the country. Lower cost to consumers are driving more people to drive hybrid vehicles and make their homes more energy efficient, all good things, without the need for government incentives to do so. It's how the market was designed to work and we should be cautious in any move that might distort the market. For the same reason, I have been concerned about the EPA's mandates and the renewable fuel standard. I have legislation out there, H.R. 424, the Level Act, to keep the EPA from fast-tracking the use of E15 in our fuel systems. Uh, the cost to consumers from this move, both at uh, the pump and at the mechanic's shop, is going to be significant, and we've yet to provide any satisfactory liability protection for the small retailer. I thank the chairman for the recognition, and I'll yield back. And I'll yield back the time. Gentleman yields back the balance of time. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, for five minutes. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding yet another uh, hearing uh, at uh, infinitum on this uh, subject. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is our 26th hearing on this particular subject matter. And uh, we had not had a law passed yet. Nothing's been signed into law yet. So Mr. Chairman, at some point, this subcommittee needs to move away from holding partisan, doomed to fail political messaging votes and get on with the business of working together to actually enact policies that will help move this country's energy policies forward and help move us away from the point of no return uh, in regards to the serious matter of climate change. Yet another hearing, Mr. Chairman, and during last week's industry hearing, we learned that we face most significant opportunities and challenges as we strive to meet the goal of $36 billion of biofuels by the year 2022 as mandated by the, the Renewable Fuel Standard, uh, which was included in the Energy Independence and Security Act uh, back in 07. And Mr. Chairman, today more than ever, we see why it is extremely necessary to move our country towards a greater reliance on alternative and renewable sources of energy as opposed to carbon intense fossil fuels that emit dangerous levels of greenhouse gases and contribute enormously to ever-present 
climate change. Over the past few years, we have seen an uptick in severe wildfires and extreme, extreme weather events associated with global climate change that's occurring all around uh, this nation and indeed around the world. <coughs> According to NOAA, the United States has set more than 40,000 hot temperature records this year alone. And the last 12 months have been the hottest ever recorded in the history of this nation. And at the end of June, Mr. Chairman, more than 113 million people in the U.S. were in areas under extreme heat advisories. And just last week, the U.S. Department of Agriculture declared a federal disaster area in more than 1,000 counties covering 26 states, making it the largest disaster declaration ever made by the USDA. Today, for the two-thirds two of the country, is experiencing drought. Well, states from your home state of Kentucky to the Midwest, where I live, facing severe losses of corn and other crops due to lack of rain. On my way in from the airport earlier, one of the airport employees uh, bemoaned the fact that corn, it, the corn crop this year would be disastrous and thereby would drive up the cost of uh, enormous amounts of consumer goods for to the American people that's hur hurting already under these economic times that we live in. Mr. Chairman, at least half of the nation's grazing pastures are in poor or very poor condition. And up to 30% of the nation's corn crop is in poor or very poor condition, which will impact, again, the price of food, consumer goods, and ethanol. Dry conditions are taking a toll on the Great Lakes, where water levels in four of the five Lakes have plummeted this summer due to high evaporation rates and insufficient rainfall, which is, of course, may pose significant challenge uh, for us who rely on the lakes for drinking water and other economic activities. Even here in the nation's capital, two weeks ago, a dirt coal caused over a million homes to lose power in the D.C. region, while states from Florida to Minnesota have experienced some of the most damaging floods in history due to torrential downfalls. Mr. Chairman, this is not about party, regardless of party, or geographics, or geography, or one's dislike of President Obama and all his policies. The, this committee, this subcommittee, can no longer afford to stick their heads in the sand and to pretend that Mother Nature is not showing us the signs that we need to act. The signs, the scientists, are also increasingly sounding the alarms and informing us that these natural catastrophes are anticipated consequences of climate change are expected and are expected to continue. Mr. Chairman, what are we doing here? When are we going to stop the charade? When are we going to move to uh, bring forth meaningful bipartisan legislation to deal with real problems and real issues? With that, I yield back the balance of my time. <coughs> the gentleman didn't have any time to yield back, but we appreciate uh, your opening or statement. Whatever. Okay, I, I'd like to introduce the witnesses on the first panel. Uh, this afternoon. Uh, first of all, we have Mr. Howard Grunspecht, 
who is the Deputy Administrator, U.S. Energy Information Administration. We have Ms. Margot Ogie, who's Director, Office of Transportation and Air Quality, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And we have Dr. Kathleen Hogan, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy Efficiency at the Department of Energy. We genuinely appreciate your being here today. We look forward to your testimony. And each of you will be given five minutes for an opening statement. And then at the end of that time, uh, there will probably be some questions. So, Mr. Grunspect, you're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Uh, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. The Energy Information Administration is the statistical and analytical agency within the Department of Energy. EIA does not promote or take positions on policy issues and has independence with respect to the information and analysis we provide. Therefore, our views should not be construed as representing those of the Department or other Federal agencies. The transportation sector and the use of petroleum fuels are tightly linked. In 2010, 71 percent of total U.S. petroleum consumption occurred in the transportation sector, while petroleum products provided 93 percent of total transportation energy. Light-duty vehicles, both passenger cars and light-duty trucks, accounted for 60 percent of total transportation energy use in 2010, with petroleum-based fuels providing 94 percent of that. Gasoline-only non-hybrid vehicles had an 86 percent market share out of 10.8 new vehicles sold in 2010, followed by flex fuel, hybrid electric, and diesel vehicles at 9 percent, 3 percent, and 2 percent, respectively. EIA's Annual Energy Outlook 2012 provides projections for the U.S. energy system through 2035. The reference case is a business-as-usual trend estimate using known technology and technological and demographic trends and the assumption that current laws and final regulations, including any applicable sunset dates, remain unchanged. Annual Energy Outlook 2012 also includes several alternative cases with market technology or policy assumptions that can significantly change the outlook for light-duty energy use, including high and low oil price cases, a case that includes the fuel economy standards proposed by NHTSA and EPA for model years 2017 through 2025, an extended policy case that raises fuel economy standards beyond 2025, and a case that considers cost breakthroughs in battery technology. Although growth in the number of drivers and vehicle miles per driver results in a projected 35 percent growth in light-duty vehicle miles of travel between 2010 and 2035 in the reference case, projected light vehicle petroleum use in 2035 is about 7.2 million barrels per day, 11 percent lower than in 2010 due to changes in the fuel mix and improved fuel economy. In the CAFE standards case, overall light vehicle energy consumption decreases by 20 percent over the same time period, with petroleum use falling to only about 5.8 million barrels per day. In both cases, petroleum products remain the dominant fuel for light-duty vehicles, but biofuels are projected to provide a growing share of their energy use, driven primarily by the renewable fuel standard mandate that's been discussed in the opening statements. Electricity usage begins to grow but remains quite small. It grows much more rapidly in the high technology battery case. Our fuel economy case analysis indicates a marked increase in the efficiency of gasoline engines both with and without microhybrid technologies. My testimony discusses several challenges surrounding the federal renewable fuel standard targets. Uh, first, since the Energy Independence and Security Act was first enacted, uh, EIA has projected that rates of technology development and market penetration for cellulosic biofuels uh, would likely fall short of the specified targets and timetables. We do believe that you get there 25 years from now, but you don't get there as quickly as the timetables uh, are set up. Our near-term projections for cellulosic biofuels have been further reduced in uh, this current edition of the Outlook. Second, nearly all U.S. motor gasoline already contains 10 percent ethanol, so increased absorption of ethanol into a fuel pool that is not growing fast requires market acceptance of ethanol blends up to 15 percent, which EPA has approved for use in model year 2001 and newer non 
flex fuel vehicles or the increased use of E85 in flex fuel vehicles, both of which face some significant market obstacles. Another pathway involves the development and market penetration of drop-in renewable fuels or renewable fuel components such as biobutanol. Four key areas of uncertainty in the annual energy outlook projections, including fuel prices, technology costs, consumer acceptance, and potential changes in policies are addressed in my testimony. Uh, the impact of alternative assumptions about technology costs are particularly striking for battery technologies. Success in attaining DOE goals leads to a very significant increase in projected market penetration of hybrid electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids, and electric vehicles compared to the sales projected in the reference case using our default cost assumptions and would likely be even more significant in the CAFE standards case. That concludes my statement, Mr. Chairman, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you or the other members may have. Thank you very much. And uh, Ms. Oge, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Russ, and the other members of the subcommittee of the committee, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. I would like to give you a brief overview of EPS efforts implementing the renewable fuel standards uh, and our efforts in developing the vehicle and truck greenhouse gas standards. In November 2011, EPA and NHTSA proposed vehicle standards for model years 2017 through 2025 calling for a CO2 standard of 160 grams per mile or equivalent to 54.5 miles per gallon by 2025. Now this builds upon our greenhouse gas and fuel economy standards for model years 2012 through 2016. These regulations provide incentives for manufacturers to produce and sell the most advanced vehicle technologies. These standards will save an estimated $1.7 trillion for consumers and business in, in our country and cut our country's oil consumption by 12 billion barrels of oil while reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 6 billion metric tons. Consumers on average will see fuel cost savings of about $8,000 for an average 2025 vehicle compared to an average 2010 vehicle over that vehicle's lifetime. Last year, the agencies also completed the first greenhouse gas and fuel economy standard for model years 2014 through 2018 for trucks and buses. These standards will reduce CO2 emissions by about 270 million metric tons and save about 530 million barrels of oil over the life of these vehicles that are built from 2014 through 2018. Uh, now, I want to note that owners of a 2018 truck will enjoy net savings of $73,000 over the vehicle lifetime uh, with a payback period from the up for the upfront cost for about a year. Also in recognition of the introduction of advanced technologies in our vehicles and alternative fuel vehicles, EPA and DOT in 2011 jointly issued an overhaul of the EPA fuel economy label. Uh, These la new labels have a lot of new information, but I want to highlight that for the first time, the labels will highlight the fuel savings or increased costs that the consumers will experience as compared to fuel costs for an average vehicle in the marketplace, whether that fuel is gasoline, diesel, electri electricity, hydrogen, or, or CNG. Now shifting over to, the, to biofuels, these fuels are a critical part of the evolving alternative fuel landscape. In 2010, EPA finalized regulations to implement the ESA revisions to the RFS program. Congress, as you know, set a target of 36 billion gallons by 2022. ESA requires EPA each year to publish an annual standard for total advanced biomass-based diesel and cellulosic renewable fuels. As directed by Congress, each year EPA conducts a thorough review of the cellulosic industry, uh, including one-on-one -on -one discussions with each producer to determine its individual production capacity. We also co consult with our colleagues from EIA, our colleagues from DOE, and USDA 
before we proposed the annual volume standards. As a result of these reviews, EPA reduced the cellulose extender to about 6.5 million gallons for 2010 and 2011 and 8.6 million gallons for 2012. That is about 98% below the ESA target for those years. This summer, we plan to finalize the 2013 biodiesel volume levels and propose the other 2013 RFS volume standards. I want to note that the biofuel sector is a dynamic one. We already have a significant list of qualified advanced and cellulosic biofuels for on-road transportation sector, as well as jet fuel and heating oil uses. Last year, we added canola-based biodiesel and approved a number of other new technology-based pathways. Most recently, we took comments on a number of advanced and cellulosic biofuels, including grain sorghum, camelina, napier grass, energy cane, and others, and we hope to finalize this um, analysis later this year. We're currently evaluating dozens, I want to say over 30, additional petitions for new biofuels, both feedstocks and different path pathways. Uh, EPA recognized the value of these fuels and the value of advanced vehicle technologies, and we look forward um, to a successful development and introduction of these new fuels and advanced technologies to the marketplace. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Hogan, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Bush, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, I do thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, as part of the President's all-of-the-above approach to American energy, the Department is advancing transportation innovations uh, to do a number of things. That is to reduce our dependence on foreign oil and the nearly $1 billion we send out of the country for oil each day, helping our vehicle manufacturing industry that accounts for about 5 percent of GDP and millions of jobs compete uh, in this global industry, and then to provide consumers with more transportation choices and cost savings, as transportation is the second biggest monthly household expense. The DOE portfolio is broad spanning light, medium, and heavy-duty vehicles and including advanced combustion, electric drive, biofuels, hydrogen fuel cells, lightweight materials, and other efforts, and we are making important progress. Electric vehicles is one important focus. Electricity is cheaper than gasoline at about a dollar per gallon equivalence. It offers competitive performance, uh, at-home charging convenience, less pollution, and is almost oil-free. Other countries, of course, recognize these benefits and are making their own investments, and we here have a critical opportunity to grow U.S. manufacturing, building upon our past successes. Today, DOE developed battery technology is in nearly every hybrid vehicle on the road. We have achieved a 35 percent cost reduction in a next generation of batteries, and we expect an additional 50 percent reduction by 2014. President Obama has announced a new EV Everywhere Grand Challenge just this last March to enable U.S. companies to lead the world in producing plug-in EVs that are as affordable and convenient as gasoline-powered vehicles and to truly spur the U.S. to further reduce costs, extend vehicle range, and improve performance and convenience. Biofuels are also important to reducing our dependence on foreign oil and developing a homegrown industry. And again, we are making great strides with cellulosic ethanol production. Uh, in the past two years, four DOE-supported commercial cellulosic ethanol biofineries broke ground. And we have also developed the know-how to produce cellulosic biomass at about $2 per gallon when at scale, uh, having reduced these costs by a factor of four over the last 10 years. Beyond ethanol, we are working to reduce the costs for cellulosic and algal-based drop-in biofuels so that we can overcome uh, some of the infrastructure issues, use our existing infrastructure, and displace diesel, jet fuel, and gasoline. Our goal here is $3 per gallon drop-ins by 2017. Integrated biorefineries are a critical part of our work to help commercialize first-of-a-kind approaches. Currently, 20 of 24 DOE-supported biorefineries are in construction or operating with an overall combined total of nearly 100 million gallons per year of advanced biofuel capacity expected by 2014. 
We also continue to work with hydrogen and fuel cells to make them cost competitive. Here, the global market has doubled in the last three years and offers important opportunities for U.S. manufacturing. Our goals for automotive, for automotive fuel cells are to be cost competitive with internal combustion engines by 2017 and for renewable hydrogen to be competitive with con conventional fuels by 2020. Progress here includes the cost of automotive fuel cells being down 80 percent since 2002, hydrogen delivery costs down 40 percent, 3 million monitored miles for fuel cell electric vehicles demonstrating good durability and more than twice the efficiency of today's gasoline vehicles, and manufacturers on track to commercialize some fuel cell electric vehicles by 2015 in that time frame, and many states developing stationary applications and infrastructure. Here, um, so I guess broadly, the President has proposed the National Community Development Challenge to enable local communities around the country to accelerate the deployment of clean, alternative fuel vehicles and infrastructure, helping communities use the technologies that best fit their local needs, whether it's electric drive, natural gas, biofuels, or another fuel. So just in summary, the transportation sector does offer a number of critical opportunities for the U.S. to meet major national objectives, such as reducing our dependence on oil, keeping America on the cutting edge of advanced manufacturing, as well as environmental issues. And so thank you for the opportunity to discuss this, and uh, we welcome your questions. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Hogan. And uh, this time I'll recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Uh, we appreciate your testimony. I want to start off with just a little editorial comment. Uh, you, you had mentioned that the President's committed to an all of the above energy policy, which he frequently does state everywhere he goes. And I know we're focusing today on uh, fuel and transportation primarily, but when he came out with this campaign website on energy sources, he neglected to even mention coal. And, of course, we can't remain competitive in the global marketplace unless we can produce electricity at a competitive rate. So I just wanted to throw that out there, even though that's not our subject matter today, because he sometimes says he's for all of the above, but some of his actions, in my view, do not indicate that. Um, Ms. Ogay, under the Renewable Fuel Standard Law, EPA is required to publish its required volume obligations for certain fuel categories on an annual basis. These obligations inform industry stakeholders as to the specific amounts of renewable fuel that must be produced, purchased, blended, or imported in order to comply with the program. Now, you all are given discretion when it relates to biomass-based diesel. And I can't get all of my dates exactly right, but at one point uh, you all had established proposed volumes for 2012 and called, I think, for 1.28 billion gallons of biomass diesel in 2013. However, when EPA issued its final rule, it included the 2012 volumes but omitted the 2013 uh, volumes for biomass diesel. And we had actually written a letter to you all about that and, asked, and was asking for an explanation of why was that omitted in the 2013 year. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you are absolutely right. We did propose uh, a biodiesel level of 1.28 um, billion gallons for 2013. Uh, we receive a, a lot of comments, especially in the area of the cost associated with uh, increasing the volume from 1 billion gallons to 1.28. So the agency had to go back and do additional analysis. So what we decided to do was to finalize the 2012 volumes and we are in the process of finalizing the 2013. Actually, our final action has um, gone over to Office of Management and Budget, and we expect a final release very soon to establish the 2013 volumes okay. for so, biodiesel. I mean, do you expect to be released within a month, or? I, I hope so. Okay. So you do intend to do it, and yes, was, yes. There were just some technical yes. issues with it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, thank thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Groomspeck, I noticed in your testimony you talked about 
that by the year 2035, you projected that the use of uh, oil for transportation purposes would be in the neighborhood of 5.8 million barrels a day, which was significant less than today. How did you conclude that that is the volume it would be in 2035? What, what assumptions did you all use? Well, we uh, develop uh, estimates of the amount of travel. Uh, that's driven by the number of licensed drivers, uh, travel per licensed driver. Uh, and a lot of it, I'm assuming, would be improved fuel standards would help. A lot reduce, of fuel economy yeah. helps, uh, helps yeah. a great deal in that. So efficiency sort of offsets the growth in travel. And we also have a significant increase in uh, the use of biofuels. Yeah. So that also offsets petroleum use. You know, one of the things that bothers me is that, you know, we talk about electric cars, we talk about fuel cells, we talk about compressed and liquid natural gas. We, we have a multitude of fuels that we're looking at for transportation purposes. All of them take significant amount of infrastructure, which really is not out there right now. And I'm, I'm just concerned myself on the availability of capital, the lack of this infrastructure, uh, going off in so many directions. I mean, within your agencies, do you all ever discuss that fact, or, or do you just want to continue pursuing a multi-source fuel sources for transportation? Well, let, let, me, let me give you an example. We are in the process of finalizing um, the 2017 to 2025 greenhouse gas and um, um, fuel efficiency standard for light duty vehicles. Uh, we, uh, again, based on the Clean Air Act, we're using the Clean Air Act, our colleagues from NHTSA is using uh, their law. We're looking at the advanced technologies, the existing technologies and advanced technologies that companies can use to, to achieve those standards. And just to give you an example, for 2025 timeframe, we expect that the, the levels of standards that we have proposed, if we indeed we finalize those standards, will be met for the most part. Over 90% of it will be met with, with existing technologies, gasoline and diesel. Okay. Uh, and less than 3% uh, is, will be relied on electric powertrain, like okay. electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids. Less than 3%. So we, less than 3%. Okay. The remaining of it will be based on, uh, on gasoline and diesel okay. and hybrid. Well, my, I had planned to ask six questions, and I'm already out of time, so okay. I'll re recognize Mr. Rush for five minutes. Thank you, Member, Mr. Waxman. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Rush, for allowing me to go first with my questions. Uh, Dr. Grunspeck, at a similar hearing last year, I raised concerns about EIA's analysis of the vehicle fuel efficiency and tailpipe standards. At that time, many of EIA's assumptions about vehicle technologies differed substantially from NHTSA and EPA projections, and EIA appeared not to have adequately engaged with NHTSA and EPA in developing the EIA analysis. The annual Energy Outlook 2012 reflects improvements in this area, but there's still some outstanding concerns about the underlying vehicle technologies data and analysis used by EIA. For example, the California Air Resources Board has raised concerns that the EIA analysis still fails to incorporate the latest data and analysis into its models. CARB has worked very closely with EPA, NHTSA, and the auto industry to develop what it describes as the most comprehensive accurate and up-to-date database of efficient and low-polluting vehicle technologies anywhere in the world, along with associated modeling capability to project how automakers will comply with the standards. Dr. Grunspeck, does EIA view the vehicle technologies data and analysis developed by NHTSA, EPA, and CARB as a valuable source of information in this area? And if so, will you commit to working more closely with these agencies to inform your own models and analysis? 
Uh, we do consider that information to be very valuable, and we do consult with our colleagues, and we uh, also consult with uh, non-governmental organizations and manufacturers, and we expect to continue to do so. Thank you. Uh, given the remarkable joint effort on the fuel efficiency and tailpipe rulemakings and the wealth of information it has produced, incorporating such information should produce a stronger analytic product. I think it's worth spending a few minutes on the tailpipe standards themselves, given their tremendous benefits. Ms. Oge, would you please summarize the full suite of benefits from the tailpipe standards? So, um, Congressman Waxman, on my opening remarks, um, I have to find the, the papers. My opening remarks, I summarized the overall benefits of the two programs. Uh, but just to give you um, a brief uh, overview of the benefits of the 2017 to 2025 program, um, which is the program that we have proposed and we're in the process of finalizing. Uh, based on the proposal, we expect that the cost on an average for the fleet, that doesn't mean for every vehicle, but on an average, would be about $2,000 per vehicle on an average for 2025. Uh, However, uh, the benefits, the net benefits that the consumer will, will, will achieve as a result of the fuel savings will be $4,400. Um, and also the, the, the other... So after accounting for any increased cost for the vehicle yes, over yes. its life, consumers would save on average 3000 under the current standards and another 4400 under the proposed standards. Consumers save this money because these vehicles use a lot less gasoline. The best way to save money at the pump is to drive right by it. But we're more used to thinking about savings at the pump in terms of gas prices. So I asked EPA to calculate how much lower gas prices would have to be, would have to, be to save a consumer the same amount of money. For a new 2012 vehicle, the net savings experienced by a consumer are equivalent to dropping the price of gas by 14 cents per gallon, and those savings will rise over time as the new vehicles become more efficient. By 2025, the proposed standards are equivalent, equivalent to lowering gas prices for the consumer by $1.13 per gallon. As the fleet turns over, eventually every light-duty vehicle driver on the road will experience these savings. Could you tell us, Ms. Oge, about EPA's heavy-duty vehicle standards? So for the heavy-duty uh, vehicle standards, um, the, um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, the cost uh, for, um, for a tractor, um, let's say th this, these are the, the heavy-duty diesel tractors that you see on our highways, uh, in 2018 would be $6,200. Well, uh, these are significant benefits, but the House Republicans have already passed legislation that would block or imperil all of EPA's tailpipe standards and to make Americans continue to spend more money at the pump as well as exacerbate climate change and our dependence on oil. Next week, they're bringing a regulatory bill to the floor that would stop EPA from finalizing the proposed tailpipe standards until unemployment falls below 6 percent. This is nonsensical. Preventing Americans from saving money at the pump certainly isn't going to help our economy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I yield back my time. This time I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your uh, diligence in pursuing these, these hearings. My first question is to the uh, representative from the Department of Energy. Could you tell us what the Department of Energy thinks the purpose of the renewable fuel standard is? What's the goal? I asked DOE, but if EPA wants to no, no. comment. I still work for EPA. So. <laughs> uh, I believe there's multiple goals to the renewable fuel standard, um, and I think it includes uh, improving our uh, independence from imported oil, uh, as well as addressing uh, environmental issues. Does the EPA want to comment on that? Agree. Okay. Well, based on that assumption, it's a um, 
it's not a mutually um, conducive goal. If, if, if the goal is to reduce oil imports, then clean coal technology and uh, more use of natural, domestically produced natural gas should be a part of any discussion about a, about a standard, although clean coal and natural gas are not renewable in the, in the classic sense. Um, both of those, certainly natural gas, would reduce emissions. I mean, I'm just a little, I'm a little puzzled because I, I read the testimony and most of the, um, the, the gentleman from the, uh, environment, the uh, Energy Information Agency is just talking about what's happened, which is kind of what EIA's job is to do. Um, the EPA and to some extent DOE's testimony is talking about the increased use of, uh, of ethanol. Uh, the problem with ethanol is that uh, if you're looking to reduce greenhouse gases, uh, ethanol goes the other way. Now, I, I'm not, I don't believe that CO2 is the danger and the enemy that some people do, but if your goal is to reduce greenhouse gases, definitely CO2 is a greenhouse gas, and you, you can't get there with ethanol. Uh, you can't get there with ethanol on a cost basis. So if the goal is to reduce foreign imports, then we look at, at uh, natural gas as a transportation fuel, and we also look at uh, uh, using clean coal to produce diesel and things like that. Uh, do, 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 Ms. Uh, Dr. Hogan, do you agree with that, what I just said? I believe we're trying to address multiple objectives, and you're trying to address them over the period of time of the RFS, which is over some period of time. And if you do look at the fuels that the RFS is uh, promoting, uh, clearly one of the things um, you are looking to do is to address carbon. Um, there's certainly been a number of studies that have been brought forward on the carbon um, profile of ethanol. I think the most recent set of studies actually show about a 20 percent benefit from ethanol. And then what I mostly talked about in my statement was not corn-based ethanol, but really cellulosic-based ethanol, which really gets you a very, very, very substantial carbon benefit. And, and certainly we can have a conversation of the multiple objectives we're trying to advance in this country. But a as I understand the RFS, it was mostly, it was for carbon as well as oil imports. Um, and we will, you know, and it is delivering on that. And, and as we look at the uh, growing, um, I guess, requirements for cellulosic based ethanol, we would see even greater benefits um, going forward. Well, the, the my time's about to expire, but the statistic that I have in front of me is that um, ethanol contains only 61 percent of the energy of gasoline. It takes 1.64 gallons of ethanol to do the same amount of work as a gallon of gasoline. That 1.64 gallons of ethanol emits 20.5 pounds of CO2. Ethanol emits one pound more CO2 in the air than using a gallon of gasoline. Now, I don't know if that's a correct statement, but that's what my staff is prepared. Do you agree with that? We can certainly um, share with you our calculations. Um, I do know that the studies that we are um, engaged with take into account uh, the energy value of ethanol versus the energy value of a gallon of gasoline. And we're um, happy to share our numbers with well, you. Well, I would encourage the department to look at um, both clean coal and also natural gas as a transportation fuel because they're both abundant domestic resources. Uh, and especially in the case of natural gas, uh, definitely reduce the amount of CO2. And clean coal done properly also does that. And with that, I yield back. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, when I was in the fifth grade in a history class, I was astounded when I my history lesson mentioned the fact that Emperor Nero 
fiddle while Rome burned. Mr. Chairman, America is burning right now. And we, Mr. Waxman and I, have asked the Republicans 15 times in the matter of a few months to hold a hearing on climate change. And we've been rebuffed on each and every occasion. You ought to touch, Mr. Chairman. This is the Committee of Jurisdiction. And this committee is out of touch with the plight of the American people. In my opening statement, I mentioned that some, uh, that some of the most extreme weather events uh, that America has ever faced are occurring right now. 40,000 high temperature records set this year. For the last 12 months, uh, they were the hottest months on record. 113 million people in the U.S. in areas of extreme health advisories. America is burning, and this subcommittee is fiddling and twiddling. The U.S. Department of Agriculture declared a federal disaster area in over a thousand counties in 24 states. Two-thirds of the U.S. is experiencing drought. One half of the U.S. grazing lands in poor or uh, very poor condition. America is burning, and this committee is fiddling and twiddling. 30% of the U.S. corn crop is in poor, very poor condition. It's, and we're talking about burning coal when America's crops and corn, America's corn is burning. The Great Lakes have been, uh, have had low water levels due to lack of rain. Mr. Chairman, when is this committee going to get in touch with what's happening in America? Um, I'd like to ask the witnesses, uh, Ms. Ms. O'Gay and uh, Ms. Coyne, why is it important that the federal government play a role in stirring, steering energy policy in the direction of the RFS and CAFE standards. Again, my Republican colleagues would like to say that we need to leave all of this to the market and everything will work out just fine. Why is it important that we have leadership from Congress to move energy policies toward greater energy efficiency, additional uh, alternative fuels, and diversity in the nation's energy Portfolio. Ms. Uh, Ogre. And Ms. Let Ho me just give you an example. Um, using um, the authority under the Clean Air Act, uh, EPA working with our colleagues from NHTSA, we have undertaken three very significant programs in the last couple of years to address greenhouse gas emissions uh, and improve fuel efficiency for our vehicles, our light duty vehicles, and for our trucks. Uh, I believe uh, that these programs are a win-win situation. Uh, and you just have to take a look and see that these programs are supported, not just by the federal government and state government, they're supported by the industries. The car companies have supported this program, the truck companies, the American Trucking Association. And the reason for that is because these investments that they will make, they pay back mm -hmm. to the consumer. So it's good for the consumer, it's good for the economy, but also it's good for our environment and for energy security. Ms. Hogan. 
And I uh, certainly agree uh, with what um, Ms. Oge had to say. And I think another aspect uh, that the Department of Energy works hard uh, to bring to the table is to support our manufacturing base here in this country. Um, there is innovation happening all the time. And we want our manufacturing base to be competitive uh, with the uh, activities uh, in these global industries. The gentleman's time has expired. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for five minutes. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, and thanks again for coming. Um, I don't take this uh, bad. I'm very friendly, friendly in this hearing. But I do want to ask Ms. Oge a question on your own e EPA estimates on the cost of a, with the new green, CAFE and greenhouse gas standards. By 2016, it will add another $1,000 to a cost of a car. And then by 2025, you are projecting $3,000 for additional cars. Is that correct? No, 2000 So it is 900 for 2016 and 2000 for 2025. Okay. I think the total probably. Oh, it's, yeah, it is cumulative, okay. I think. Okay. So we had 1 plus 2. Then, mm -hmm. then let me go on. Um, and you also calculate, I think it is just good for the record, that you, you are projecting that people will buy these new cars and they will keep them, uh, their lifetime will be about 200,000 miles. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. I think that is pretty generous, but I hope you are correct in, in that. Um, for both Ms. Oge and, and Ms. Hogan, I am reading, um, I do believe that we are on the verge of uh, getting close to the cellulosic goals and desires. I you know, am very fortunate to have the, uh, the National Corner Ethanol Research Center in, at SIU Edwardsville. And last month, they uh, the researchers at Southern Illinois University editors will say they have successfully produced ethanol from the cellulosic portion of the corn kernel by utilizing existing technology that you can find in the commercial marketplace. And then obviously they believe it's bolt on cellulosic ethanol reality, which, and I tried to do this in the last he hearing um, of last week. I kind of portrayed a what is a kernel of corn for, for the lay people. And there's about six different parts of a of kernel of corn that some go to uh, fermented ethanol, uh, but the benefit of cellulosic is using another portion of that. Uh, I also tried to highlight in just the food fuel debate that even when you're doing the uh, fermentation, a byproduct is distilled dry grains, which goes into the livestock feed markets, and we actually ship that all over the all over the world as a commodity product. But there's that's why we have these hearings so that we can we can get out the full facts and, and full um, data and statistics on this. Let, uh, Ms. Oge, I was, I was curious on the CAFE standards and trying to rectify that with uh, what Elliot Engel and I are trying to do with the open fuel standard, which is that bill that I talked about. Basically, it has a, a phase in of flex fuel vehicles for the most part to 50 percent by the vehicle fleet by 2014 and 80 percent by 2016. Under your ability to do that with, uh, how would we go about that based upon what you all have been able to do with CAFE and the greenhouse gas rules? How does that segue into that process? Uh, so for the, for the greenhouse gas standards, uh, we, um, until through 2016, we will provide the car companies the same benefit that they will get uh, introducing flex fuel vehicles in the marketplace that they are getting under the CAFE program. As you know, uh, those um, incentives go away in 2019 for CAFE. But EPA will continue to evaluate how much actually E85 is used in the marketplace. And then we clearly know uh, the car companies that are selling flex fuel vehicles, and we will give them credits towards meeting their greenhouse gas standards uh, for light duty vehicles. And, and I just want to make sure I, I keep on record I, I love fossil fuels, so I'm not anti fossil fuels. I'm concerned about the 45% that we import and the national security implications. Now, I do hope that with Keystone and Coal to Liquid and other things that we can also have more local supply, but my focus has always been the, the national security ramifications of the sea lanes closing and the, then the catastrophic events that could occur. So uh, for all my crude oil folks and refineries and my coal guys, don't worry, I'm, 
I'm, st I'm still on board and I'm still uh, part, of the, part of the overall team. Uh, Ms. Oge, I, I want to ask the last question is on the, um, the E15. Uh, can E15 be introduced for some vehicles but not others without widespread misfueling? And then the agency has issued misfueling and mitigation plan. Do you think that's adequate? So, so, um, uh, so we have looked uh, at the Clean Air Act, um, our existing regulations, and we believe, again, based on the law that is in front of us, we have used the best legal uh, justification and scientific justification to um, uh, waive uh, E15 for the use of 2001 and newer vehicles. However, there is lack of data uh, to what extent E15 could potentially um, uh, impact uh, the environmental control systems for vehicles older than 2001 and off-road equipment. And that's what we need to look when we, look, when we do these waivers. It's really to what extent a new fuel will impact uh, the um, uh, pollution control systems. And based on lack of data, we have decided that we're not going to allow E15 to be used in the marketplace for those older vehicles and off-road equipment. Now, what I, may, what I have to say is that when we waive the use of E15 for 2001 and newer vehicles, we're not mandating it. So we're not requiring the marketplace to use E15. But we are telling uh, all the parties involved that if you use E15, there are a number of things that you need to do. Uh, and uh, you need to make sure that uh, there are product um, uh, transfer data that we can evaluate from point A to point Z. We're going to make sure that there is an appropriate labeling at the stations. Uh, clearly, there are issues that is, goes beyond my office that have to do with um, uh, dispensing units and to what extent uh, are appropriate to be used with E15 if they have not been designed for E15, underground storage tanks. So there are a slew of issues that a, a, a company in the marketplace will have to decide to what extent they're going to have to meet in order to market E15 in the marketplace. This time I recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the witnesses. Uh, actually, I think it's, it's fairly remarkable. I, I, the chart that's uh, attached to the EIA's um, testimony tells a very positive story. And frankly, um, you know, for, for decades, all you heard in America was we're increasing our use of fossil fuels or increasing our use of uh, oil. Oil consumption has risen steadily until very recently. Uh, until very recently, the Energy Information Administration has consistently projected that U.S. oil consumption would continue to rise into the future. And every president I can remember and past Congresses have talked about reducing our dependence on oil, uh, but none has uh, succeeded in doing so until now. Uh, this year's annual energy outlook projects that America will consume less and less oil for decades to come. And this is great news uh, for, yes, for the climate. Uh, it's good news for consumers and their pocketbooks at a, at a time when they need a little relief. Uh, it's very positive for America's energy security. And uh, you have to say our manufacturing sector that has been uh, improving, improving. The last couple months a little shakier, but I think this is going to be an area where uh, we'll be able to create jobs in the future. Uh, Mr. Grunspeck, how have the Obama administration's final and proposed fuel efficiency and tailpipe pipe standards affected EIA's forecast for oil consumption over the, the coming years? You can get into a little more detail than your opening statement. Sure. Uh, well, again, the uh, projections for transportation energy use depend on economic activity, uh, depends on uh, the number of licensed drivers, how much they travel, uh, the efficiency of the vehicles, which the fuel economy standards uh, definitely have an impact on. 
uh, light duty truck fuel economy standards started to be raised in the previous administration, and then this administration came in and proposed first the model year uh, 2012 to 2016. Uh, that chart that you referred to in my testimony, by the way, is for the reference case. It, it would look uh, to be even lower energy consumption uh, with the uh, CAFE standards case. So again, uh, in my testimony, there's a little table that shows uh, what difference the uh, efficiency standards make. Uh, certainly, energy prices are also making a difference, uh, less welcome to the American people in part. Uh, you know, if one is looking not only at petroleum consumption, if one is looking at, at imports, uh, then energy production is also making a mm -hmm. contribution. So we're both reducing our petroleum uh, demand, if you will, mm -hmm. both by greater efficiency and by substituting other fuels. And uh, we're also uh, increasing our, our domestic production. Mm -hmm. and, and clearly, these projected reductions didn't just magically appear there in substantial part the result of the administration's uh, fuel efficiency and tailpipe standards. Um, I think it is a tremendous achievement for the Obama administration. Uh, but even better, these standards also save consumers money and reduce our dependence on foreign oil. I thank my colleagues who have been here for a while that were oftentimes pushing uh, past administrations. And a few years ago, the Congress, uh, under Democratic control, gave a substantial push to so to my colleagues who were there then. Uh, my hat's off to them as well. Uh, Ms. Ogay, would you tell us a little bit more about how these standards will save Americans at the pump? And I, I can tell you just from personal experience, I had a relative that purchased one of these, uh, and you see more and more of them on the road, and he loves the fact that he gets 50 miles per gallon. And when you know gas prices are, have fallen again, but when they were up, he loved driving by the gas station and driving by it again and again because 50 miles per gallon. You know, I know that it cost a little bit more, but over the life of the vehicle, and now with teenage daughters that may be looking to drive, um, I know they're going <laughs> to save money. But uh, go ahead. So, so, so as you said, uh, these programs uh, collectively, uh, the, uh, the 2012 to 2016. Uh, greenhouse gas fuel efficiency improving standards for light duty cars, 2017 to 2025, that's the proposal that I just made, and the truck rule, the truck and buses, uh, are good for the users and the consumers' um, uh, the climate, energy security, and innovation in this country. Just to give you an example, in, uh, so our greenhouse gas fuel efficiency standards started this year. So actually, uh, this year, there are about 100 models that you can go out and buy that meet the standards of 2017, of what we propose for 2017. So that tells you the innovation that is going on in our country, uh, developing these technologies. And as you know, the car industry is doing extraordinarily well. Well, my time has run out. But I, I do want to congratulate you and, and your whole team for the progress that you have made. And to close, Thank Mr. You. Chairman, I would like to encourage you to, to call a, a hearing on climate change. I think that the committee and the Congress could benefit uh, from the testimony of many experts that could advise us on, on policy and what else we should be doing to address the serious problem. Well, I really appreciate that suggestion. And I might remind everyone, over the last five years, we have had a multitude of hearings on climate change. And I'm sure that we will in the future as well. This time I'd like to recognize Mr. Terry for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Grunschbeck, uh, uh, help me with a couple of things here. First of all, uh, uh, as uh, energy usage uh, is related to economy in a sense that if economy is growing, will uh, the effect will be energy use grows. Is that a correct assumption? Uh, all else equal, uh, economic growth does lead to uh, more energy use. And a uh, shrinking economy results in less usage of energy, uh, historically. We have seen that. You have seen that. In fact, we have seen it in the last four years. Well, I mean, the, uh, we saw it for a portion of the last four years. Yeah. And uh, I think now the economy is growing. 
Uh, but there was a time, certainly, when the economy was not growing over the last four years, and energy use did fall uh, dramatically. Yeah. So if, if we want to, uh, in general, uh, complement the administration for bringing down usage of gasoline, we should also then complement them for our slow and recession, slow growth economy and recession. I don't think that's a rhetorical question. You don't have <laughs> Thank to you. Answer that. But you do have to answer this one. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, when we were debating on the floor and developing the renewable fuel standard several years ago, there was an assumption that uh, a good part of the growth would come from cellulosic ethanol. We haven't seen that yet today. So uh, I'm going to ask this to both you, Mr. Grunspeck, and you, Ms. Hogan. Why haven't we? Why, why aren't we seeing mass production of cellulosic energy in July of 2012? Well, I follow the data more, so I think uh, Ms. Oge could go into the reasons. But, uh, you know, we, we are, as suggested in uh, Ms. Oge's testimony, we do every year and in the legislation provide uh, an estimate to uh, EPA uh, of our view of what might be produced. Uh, I think the estimate we provided them this past year for 2012 was 6.7 million gallons, which is a lot less than the 500 million that was envisioned in the statute. So instead of repeating back the statute, okay. so you, you know right. I have limited right. time. Actually, it'll be, it'll be less. Are educated we, in how to use that up. Right. But if you would just answer, why aren't we seeing it? I, I'm asking honestly. No, I, I, I'm I mean, not I, trying to fill I support it. I'm not a senator. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, think it's, I think it's hard. I think the, the, the technology, you know, the, some plants are going to come on this year, we believe. It will not be as high as, as what we thought. It will certainly not be as high as the legislative has, level. Has uh, EIA, uh, in regard to biofuels, ethanol and biodiesel, began to factor in the consequences of the drought hitting the Corn Belt this year? And is that going to any way affect uh, fuel prices? It would, it, it would affect uh, ethanol prices to some extent. Corn is the major input to ethanol. Uh, one gets about 2.8 uh, gallons of ethanol per bushel of corn. So if the price of a bushel of corn would, would rise, uh, that would tend to lead to an increase in the cost of producing ethanol. Uh, ethanol is not the only product. Distillers' dry grains are also produced, and those have some value. So it's not that the full increase in the price of corn has to show up in the uh, cost of producing ethanol, but a lot of it will. Uh, again, keep in mind that ethanol right now is about 10 percent of the oh, fuel, right. you know, uh, the content of gasoline by volume. So a, uh, an increase of, uh, you know, 50 cents per gallon uh, of ethanol, which would be more than the impact, a lot more than the uh, impact. If it's of only ethanol, 50 would, cents, would I think it'd be lucky. Like yeah. Ms. Osi, do you have anything to add with those two questions? You know, I, I ask the same question myself, and, uh, you know, so what I did this year uh, is I asked the major uh, cellulosic companies to come and talk to me, and I said, let's talk, let's figure out what is going on, because like here you're saying, what is going on? And this is what I have learned. What I have learned is we're talking about five years. ESA passed in 2007, so we're talking about five years. And, and, and I have concluded that significant progress has been made when you consider talking about very advanced biofuel and technologies from R&D to pilot demonstration to commercial availability. And this year, uh, we are going to see commercial scale uh, cellulosic plants in, in this country. The other thing that we need to keep in mind is that despite what, this is what I learned from these companies, despite um, the tough economic conditions that our country has been going through, uh, significant private sector investments have been made uh, in this sector. Uh, what I was told is that about $2.4 billion uh, from venture capitalists have been, you know, invested yeah for these fuels. 
Uh, and furthermore, what I'm hearing is that uh, we're moving, not only we're moving from pilot to large commercial scale, but when you talk to large companies like BP and DuPont that, again, are investing significant amount of, of money, they're committed to bring large commercial scale of cellulosics in 2014 timeframe. So uh, I think we're beginning to see a move, significant move from pilot uh, to commercial scale, and if that continues, I think the, the hope of cellulosics uh, right, can be you. realized. This time right now, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank each of you for being here today. Ms. Ogay, my questions uh, today, uh, just reminisce, we had a subcommittee hearing and oversight and investigations last week on the REN fraud issue. And Mr. Bunker and Mr. Brooks answered some of my questions, but I understand you also are involved in finding a solution to this problem, so I wanted to make sure I look at the opportunity, took this opportunity to, uh, to discuss this with you as well. The EPA maintains that petroleum refiners are expected to exercise good business judgment and use due diligence. I know that the obligated parties have been pressing the EPA for months to formally define what merits due diligence. and what do you expect from that? My first question was, will the agency be able to propose and finalize the rules so that programs can be in place before 2013? Uh, we're, uh, uh, Congressman, we're working very hard uh, to come up with solutions. Uh, the goal is to have um, final actions taken place by the end of the year. Um, uh, we want to make sure that both sides of the industry, the biodiesel sector, and the uh, obligated parties, which is the refining industry, working with us. And up to date, um, I want to let you know is that uh, we have had very collaborative efforts. So I remain very optimistic that we're going to be able to resolve this issue. Okay. And I know from our testimony last week by uh, Mr. Bunker and Mr. Brooks, there is a cooperative effort. Is it possible for EPA to issue a separate expedited rulemaking to ensure that the rule becomes effective before 2013? We will work very hard and do our best, sir. Okay. If not, uh, could EPA make some other type of administrative adjustment to help small biodiesel producers before 2013? We heard from some of them last week that uh, a lot of refiners in my area are just not going to go to these folks because they don't know what due diligence is. Yeah. Uh, uh, clearly, the, the solutions that we're evaluating, and, and you can imagine that there are solutions and proposals from both sides, we, we want to make sure that we are not going to have unintended consequences, which is impact of small biodiesel producers. Okay. Aside from the notice of violations issued to three fraudulent biodiesel producers, how many invalid REN producer investigations are ongoing? Do you know? I know we have three that are, that are public, but do we have a number of other investigations ongoing? I, I don't know, sir. I'm not, in, I'm not overseeing the enforcement office at EPA. Okay. And do you know how many invalid RIN investigations were concluded that found no violation occurred? I don't. Okay. If you, could, if you could check and get that back with us. In May of 2011, we held a similar hearing to this one, and I submitted a question for the record asking EPA for its estimate for misfueling was in the first few years of the E15's existence at gas pumps. EPA responded that you didn't have uh, enough information on the E15 market penetration to make an estimate. But since then, EPA has registered over 65 companies to market E15 and has approved over 50 com companies' um, misfueling mitigation plans. Additionally, over 80 companies have enrolled in an approved national compliance survey. Are you in a place where you could now make an estimate on uh, that question? Uh, my understanding is that there is only one station in the country that is uh, introducing E15. So again, um, we don't have the data uh, available to us given the limited introduction of E15 in the marketplace. However, we did um, approve um, the, mis the, the misfueling mitigation plans from uh, from. Uh, 60 to 80 um, renewable fuel producers, and we believe that these plants will minimize uh, the misfueling uh, concerns that, that you have expressed. Okay. Um, only one station in the country has E15? That's my understanding. I assume it's in Mr. Terry's district <laughs> or Mr. Shimka's. <laughs> I believe it's in Kansas. Oh, uh, okay, that's close enough. <laughs> 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 uh, 
I want to follow up on my colleague from Texas, Congressman Barton, because again, uh, some of the success we've had and uh, um, with and we're seeing it slowly in natural gas to be a uh, transportation fuel. And I know it's not a renewable fuel, but it's one that we are producing substantially in our country. And, and of course, seven years ago, I would not be talking about it because natural gas is $12.50 or $13 per million cubic feet, but now it's less than $3. Uh, is uh, EPA actually looking at that su sustainable growth? in using e uh, natural gas as a transportation fuel with the benefit of the, uh, the, the clean air issues and the carbon issues? Yeah. Clearly, we're looking at that as part of the 2017-2025 greenhouse gas rule. We have received a number of comments from um, the natural gas industry and OEMs uh, about the potential benefits of natural gas vehicles. So we're in the process of evaluating these uh, comments and suggestions that we have received. But also natural gas is cleaner at the tailpipe, about 18 to 20 percent less carbon. So I think it can compete very well on this, for these new standards that we are planning to finalize sometime this summer. But Okay. We we'll appreciate the time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This time I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Dr. Burgess, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Ms. Ogie, on that same line, uh, there is a uh, large tractor-trailer manufacturing plant in Denton, Texas, the district that I represent, uh, the Peterbilt Corporation that is actually producing an off-the-line natural gas vehicle for the long haul as well as short haul applications and my understanding is that is a little bit more expensive but the expectation is the fuel cost recovery will happen in a very short period of time 12 to 18 months which over the life cycle of that vehicle is very manageable um, and they're doing it all without federal subsidies without any federal law they're doing it because it is the right thing to do when people are anxious to purchase that type of vehicle and natural gas of course has uh, We've seen the, the story on that from 10 years ago to now. The cost has come down tremendously. I'm concerned and have been concerned since we had a briefing between Department of Energy and the Environmental Protection Agency on the, the, the E15 gas. And you've approved that for models, autom automotive models that are later than 2001. Um, but you haven't approved it for earlier engines, you haven't approved it for marine vehicles, for boats, and you haven't approved it for the small engines. So what are the problems with those pre-2001 engines, boat engines, small engines? What are the problems that occur that uh, led you to refrain from approving the use of E15 in those engines? Question for me? Or yeah, for the Department of Energy. So, so, so clearly, uh, when we look at the data for older vehicles, older than 2001, uh, there was insufficient data to approve it, but also our engineering judgment uh, was that um, um, given the technologies that those vehicles were using, and again, we're talking about emission control systems, we were sufficiently concerned uh, that um, E15 could potentially uh, increase the emissions from those vehicles. So the agency decided not to approve those vehicles. Now for How many did you test? Excuse me? How many did you test, do you uh, know? For um, the testing that took place was only um, uh, under the Department of Energy for 2001 and newer vehicles. Uh, and uh, Ms. Hogan can speak about, about the work that they have done. So when we approved the, the 2001 and, and, and newer vehicles, we had the DOE data and we had sig significant additional data for newer vehicles. However, there is very limited information for older vehicles uh, and off-road equipment. So the agency decided, given on this lack of data, or rather limited data, not to approve the use of E15. But, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when unleaded gasoline became the norm and you had the side-by-side -side fueling pumps and you changed the nozzle sizes and all that stuff. But still, there were, mis there were, there were fueling accidents, misfueling applications that occurred. Do you have any experience from going back to the 70s that serves as a template to prevent misfueling? 
problems? I wasn't in the agency in the, in the 1970s, but the agency but does have experience. The only thing I want to say, there is, a, there is a difference between the unlanded gasoline in E15. Um, back in the 70s, uh, there was a mandate for using unleaded gasoline uh, for certain vehicles. Here, E15 is, is, you know, we're not mandating E15 to be used. No, in you're place. mandating a volume of ethanol to be blended with all of the gasoline that's sold in the country. And as a consequence, every snowblower, every lawnmower, every pump is going to be contaminated with E15 within a very short period of time. And you know that. I mean, that is going to happen. That's a, that's a sad reality of where we've gone, which is why, and I think, you know, we've heard reference from Mr. Rush, this is a tough summer, grain production is, is way off. Why are we continuing to follow this foolhardy policy? I mean, it was done under President Bush, and I acknowledge that, but I think it's time to recognize the limitations of this and move away from what really is a, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a policy that follows common sense. Ms. Hogan, um, I just wanted to ask you a question. On your bio on the website, it uh, talks that you were the, uh, one of the principal overseers of uh, $16 billion in stimulus funding at EERE. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. And I know you wouldn't have it with you today, but can, can we ask you to uh, provide the committee with uh, some detail on how that money has been spent, how much is left, what it was spent for. Uh, you referenced your testimony, the new, all the new batteries that are going to be produced. I'm having difficulty trying to calculate the cost per battery. It looks high, but I want to be fair about it. So could you provide us the, the line item budgetary detail on that $16.4 billion that your agency administered? Uh, we absolutely can provide you with that detail. All right, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate that, and I'll yield back the balance of my time. This time, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Pompeo, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, witnesses, for coming out today. I, uh, Ms. Ogie, I, I read your testimony twice, and I saw precious little discussion of cost and price for consumer. It was all about mandates and department investments and that kind of thing, and that always that always troubles me an awful lot when you don't when you don't trust consumers to really do what's in their best interest, and that, uh, I think, is what the RFS is, is riddled with. Uh, Mr. Waxman mentioned price. He said that Republicans are preventing consumers from saving money. Uh, do you think that's true? That's not my position to say what the Republicans or Democrats are doing, sir. I'm a, I'm a civil servant. Do I'm not here representing think, any political views. Do you think, do you views. think if, uh, yeah, he, he was just, yeah, just repeating what he said. Um, do, 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 you, do you think that folks who, who um, op oppose some of the, the RFS standards, do you think uh, that that is re preventing consumers from saving money? Uh, I want to remind Congress that EPA is implementing a law that Congress passed in 2007. So we're looking at the law. Uh, we're using the best science and legal interpretation to implement yeah, the I, law. I, I appreciate that. I've seen some of that. An, an electric vehicle today, if a consumer was going to go out and purchase one, would it save that consumer money today? A new vehicle? Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. A, uh, a new vehicle today will be more fuel efficient than the vehicle of yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, based on our analysis, the answer is yes. And, so uh, and the data that I have that I can, and I can tell you about 2012, but the data that I have is for 2016. So if you buy a new vehicle in 2016, you will pay $950 more, but you will save $3,000 from fuel um, consumption, savings in fuel, assuming that the gasoline prices in 2016, according to EIA, will be about the same number, level as it is today. Sure. And so consumers aren't choosing that in great numbers yet. You, you would agree with that? Yes. And the reason they're choosing more expensive vehicles than are available in the marketplace today is because of what set of circumstances? I didn't say that, the f that they're well, choosing more expensive I'll, I'll, I'll vehicles. Come, I'll come back. They're, they're not choosing a whole lot of electric vehicles. You would agree with that. Yet you said it was more economical for them to choose that today. How do you account for that what, disconnect? What I said is that the 2012 to 2016 greenhouse gas standards and fuel efficiency standards are good for the consumer because the consumer, on an average, 
will save money at the pump that will more than offset the upfront cost of the vehicle. Right. And, and so that's the data that we have. Right, and Furthermore, what I want to note is that all the car companies have agreed on that and they're supporting the program. So I think they know something more than I do. Could be. I'm just trying to okay. figure out how come consumers don't know as much as you do about what's good for them. Uh, how many cellulosic RINs have been generated over the life of the renewable fuel standard? I don't have the number, but there were a number of cellulosic RINs that they were developed as part of the RFS-1, that is the 2005 program. And I believe um, for 2011, 20% 20 of the uh, uh, cellulosic RINs were used to meet the cellulosic standard. But I need to get back to that on specifics, but there were cellulosic RINs that have been developed. I, I would appreciate it if you could get that to us. I, I, I looked at the website. It looked to me like there had not been any during the entire course of the program. It looked like on the EPA's website there had been no cellulosic RINs. So if you could, if I'm wrong about that, I, I would appreciate you letting me and the committee know. Uh, Mr. Gunspect, if, if, if the RFS has filled its 36 billion gallons, um, I've seen estimates that that would mean that we'd need 40 percent ethanol. Uh, does that sound about right to you, assuming the CAFE standards are fully met? Does that sound about right? Uh, if, if it were all ethanol, we, we expect a lot of, uh, you know, renewable diesel uh, drop-in fuels as well. But it would be about 40 percent of the fuel pool by volume if it right. were all ethanol. Right. And but today the fleet can't handle on average a 40 percent fuel volume. Is that right? No. Uh, today that would be right. And so, Ms. Ogie, where are we going to put all this extra ethanol? Well, again, you know, uh, the 2007 ESA rule did not mandate ethanol to be used. Congress actually did not mandate a specific biofuel. And I think there is um, a lot of. Um, progress that we have seen on drop-in fuels, uh, biobutanol, biomass to liquid for both biodiesel and gasoline, uh, uh, biogas and bioelectricity. Uh, as I said in my testimony, also we have seen uses beyond the transportation, the cars and trucks, uh, jet fuel and home heating oil. Okay. So um, um, well, I, hope, I, hope I understand I, your yeah, concern, yeah. Uh, but again, I, I think there is a lot of innovation in fuels that w are not going to be limited by the so-called blend wall that has been. I, ho I hope you're right. I hope it can be done affordably. I'm, I'm less optimistic than you are. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm out of time. I yield back. This time I recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. You know, the thing about the auto industry is that they never knew what was good for them. Their CEOs were oblivious. They fought every year fuel economy standards in this committee. How do I know? Because I made the amendment every year, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2005. And the auto industry all sat out there, all sending the signal up, no, we can't do it. It's not good for us. And they did it very successfully until they had turned themselves into technologically obsolescent companies heading towards bankruptcy that then asked the American taxpayers with hands out to please save us from the fact that no one wants to buy our vehicles. And none of those CEOs are around any longer because they all got canned because they did not know what was good for their companies. And unemployment just kept rising higher and higher in the automotive sector because no one would buy their vehicles. Then the federal government came in and we gave them a loan to help bail them out. But moreover, out of this committee in 2007, out in the, House, out in the uh, conference committee, we passed a bill to increase fuel economy standards uh, to 35 miles per gallon. By the way, all the auto industry is saying they can't do it. So we actually gave them a couple of more years to go out to 2020 in that bill. And then the Supreme Court ruled in Massachusetts versus EPA that, uh, that uh, the EPA had a responsibility to make a decision as to whether or not greenhouse gases uh, were uh, dangerous uh, to the planet, which it did, which then ultimately empowered the use of the California Clean Air Act. And to President Obama's credit, he never passed any laws, let's be honest. He never filed any suits before the Supreme Court, let's be honest. But 
What he did do was he took the authority that we had given him, the Supreme Court had given him, and he acted on it. So here's where we are, ladies and gentlemen. Back in 2007, I looked around, I looked around. I was really trying to find a very good American hybrid sedan, and it was hard to find. As a matter of fact, non-existent. So I bought a Camry hybrid that got 33 miles per gallon. By the way, that's the EPA standard for the purposes of NHTSA, for the purposes of reaching 54.5 miles per gallon, which is really what we should be talking about here, so that everyone understands that it's the NHTSA standard, not EPA. You should have NHTSA down here, not the EPA. Um, then my car, as it's in a 2011 version, is now getting 47 miles per gallon. The Camry Hybrid today. And they have all the way until 2026 to take the single most popular sedan in the United States and figure out how to squeeze eight more miles per gallon out of it. Now, can the auto industry figure that out? Well, the Republicans say, no, they can't do it. It's going to paralyze them. And so they're going to have a vote next week that strips the EPA from completing the regulation from 2017 to 2025 that will get us to 54 0.5 miles per gallon, when a Camry sedan is already at 47 miles per gallon today as you walk into the showroom. Now, how sad a commentary is that on the confidence the Republicans have in the innovation and technological capacity of the automotive industry? Sad, isn't it? And by the way, they've bought into this American technological inferiority argument for all the time I've been on the committee. They just don't think America can do it. They don't think that our auto industry can do it, even though Toyota is already up to 50, 47 miles per gallon for a Camry today. Now, what's the consequence of them repealing this? I'll tell you what. Between now and 2030, if we meet 54.5 miles per gallon, it's 3. million barrels of oil a day. You want sleepless nights? Uh, Saudi shakes, that'll do it. And it's 4.7 million barrels by the year 2040. Why should we export young men and women over to the Middle East when we can be exporting fuel-efficient vehicles all around the planet made in America? The unemployment rate is plummeting in the automotive sector because they're now making vehicles people want to buy because they're fuel-efficient. And the Republicans are now going to go back to the old plan of technological obsolescence that led to the problem in the 70s when I had to vote here to bail out Chrysler. Then I wait and I get a second chance to bail out Chrysler again in 2009. How fortunate am I that twice I get to see how little they understand about the need for continued innovation if they're going to be competitive on the open marketplace. But the tragedy is, let's be honest, it's the amount of oil that the Republicans are allowing to continue to be imported from the Middle East because that's where we put 70% of all the oil we consume in our country, in gasoline tanks. And the single greatest weapon we have is increased fuel economy standards. And they're going to repeal that next week? Well, you're going right at the heart of the number one national security vote that anyone is casting in Congress this year. And we're going to have a hell of, the, of, of a debate over whether or not that helps or hurts our country. I yield back to balance. The gentleman's time has expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for five minutes. Thank the gentleman for yielding and uh, again thank the chairman for this continued conversation as we've, uh, as we've looked over hearing and hearings for, for months now about ways that we can improve this country's woeful energy policy uh, and, and also work to create jobs. I, uh, I want to ask first Mr. Grunspeck on the, some of the data that comes out of the Energy Information Administration. Um, we've we viewed and you know we look in the Gulf of Mexico at uh, at a lot of uh, a lot of slowdown in in exploration uh, as well as production I understand that y'all have come out with some reports recently uh, looking at using some data to look at production in the Gulf of Mexico it's my understanding uh, that you've got projections that show that uh, this year production uh, would be down roughly 30 percent from last year do you know what the what the data your agency has on that is? Uh, I'd, be sur I'd be surprised at that number. Maybe something like 30,000 barrels, but 30 percent 
from last year to this year. That doesn't sound right to me, but I will go back and check. Do you have any data in front of you uh, regarding where production is? In just start with the Gulf of Mexico. I, I want to uh, look at some I, other areas I don't too. Really ha I don't have the detail on the Gulf of Mexico in front of me. I know that for crude oil production as a whole, uh, and again, the Gulf of Mexico has, as you know, and I know some you know issues that surrounded the moratorium, but for the U.S. as a whole, crude oil production uh, rose by about 200,000 barrels a day in 2011. Now you're uh, counting no, private I mean, land, right, federal uh, land, tide oil, and the, all in. everything. Right. All right. If you if you just broke it down to federal lands, federal lands, I think in 2011 was down a bit from 2010. W what's a bit? Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but I would be glad to get it for you. So you know exactly how much it is up overall when you don't count federal lands, but right, then you just conveniently don't know how much it is down when you actually talk about the areas that the federal government has control? Well, bec because I have a summary of the short-term outlook before me that doesn't have all the regional detail, but I will definitely right. get it. For uh, well, but I mean, when we're I making mean, policy... Of the Mexico last yeah, when we're making policy in Washington, uh, you know, there are states that, that have their own programs in place. You have people that have private land that are able to, right. to lease that private land out. Uh, but then where we really have the purview is, is over those areas uh, where the federal government has control through uh, both the Department of Energy with the EPA. You've got, uh, of course, the Department of Interior and all of these agencies control federal lands. And what we've seen is that production is actually down in the areas where the federal government has control. Uh, now, do you dispute that, or do you know that that is I the think case? In, in 2011, it was lower than 2010. And, and that's, you know, it's, it's something, I guess, that perplexes a lot of us when we hear the president out going around the country bragging that production's higher. Uh, and yet when you look in the areas where the president has control, production's actually down. The areas that, that he could help us uh, to increase production, it, it's actually going the opposite way because of his policies. In fact, we just saw with the five-year lease plan that was released. Uh, I'm not sure if you've evaluated this. I know EIA has looked at it. Uh, but uh, from the reports we've seen, uh, the latest five-year lease plan in the Outer Continental Shelf uh, that the president released actually closes off about 85 percent of areas that were getting ready to come open for exploration. Have you, have you seen that? Have you looked at that data? I have not looked at that. I'm aware that there, I guess, is going to be some drilling in the federal offshore uh, off of Alaska, I believe, is planned for this year. And I believe, and we are projecting, a growth in the Gulf of Mexico production uh, in the future. But there's no question that the aftermath of the Macondo disaster did have an impact on Well, well but it was, the, it was the aftermath that was based on the President's policies that went against actually some of his own scientists and engineers. There was a 30-day report that the President uh, put together a team of scientists and engineers after the Macondo explosion uh, to, to look at and evaluate what we do to impre increase safety. Uh, and then the President tried to use that report to impose the moratorium that you referred to. And the scientists and engineers, basically, they, they called a file and said, no, we did not suggest that. And the White House recanted. Somebody in the White House doctored the, the report. But the scientists and engineers actually said, you will reduce safety in the Gulf. Uh, you'll actually run jobs out of this country. And we've seen that. We've seen about uh, over, almost 20,000 jobs, American jobs, have been lost because of that policy. Uh, and we've lost some of our best rigs, some of our most experienced crew base. So the president went against his own scientists and engineers who actually said, you'll, you'll reduce safety by having a moratorium. Uh, and so that, that may have something to do with the reduced production on federal lands. Uh, I want to ask Ms. Ms. Ogay, uh, we've been talking about the, uh, the E-10 and, and you know, increases potentially coming up. Um, do you all work with, with gas stations, with car manufacturers, uh, that do have concerns they brought up in this committee and other places about uh, what liability issues there would be, uh, the cost that would be associated uh, with, with going to a higher level. What, what kind of coordination do you have with them to address those valid concerns that they have? We have had extensive discussions with gas stations um, and extensive discussions with the car companies. And again, um, the, the basis for the waiver uh, is the Clean Air Act, that requires the agency to evaluate the potential impacts on emission control systems and emissions from vehicles as a result of a new fuel and, f uh, and fuel additive. And that's the analysis that we have done. Um, uh, as far as the gas stations concerns, um, we have uh, incorporated misfueling uh, requirements 
for the renewable fuel producers. And for the car companies, we, uh, when we met with them and they did express concerns, we asked them to provide to us any data, any scientific data that they have that um, demonstrates that E15 will um, undermine the emission control systems for 2001 and newer vehicles. Uh, and they have not provided any data. So based on the extensive uh, scientific data that we have received, testing from the Department of Energy and other studies, the agency has concluded that uh, E15 will not have uh, any impacts when it comes to an, uh, emission control systems for 2001 and, and newer vehicles. So does that address the line uh, amount of time? I yield back. Time has expired. This time I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sleepless nights for Saudi sheiks. In my part of the world, you give the Saudi sheiks sleepless nights by looking at turning coal into gas. And I'm just wondering uh, what thoughts have gone into that and if there's any uh, intent to support my alt fuels bill, H.R. 2036, which would allow for uh, the alt fuels to include coal that has been turned into gasoline. It looks like we can do it for about $94 a, a, a barrel. And we are the Saudi Arabia when, of coal. And so I'm just wondering, uh, when y'all going to get on that ship and sail with us to a better America? Sir, I'm not familiar with your bill, but I, I can take your request back and, and take a look at it. All right. And generally, uh, if not my bill, some other bill regarding uh, coal being converted into gas. What are your thoughts on that? You don't have to be familiar with my bill to have some thoughts on this, I assume. I don't have any views. All right. We heard the president talk about algae and uh, its potential, and I'm just wondering if, uh, if perhaps uh, either of you on, can, or any of you can give me uh, some idea of where we stand on that. My bill also touches on algae, so it's not that I'm anti-algae. I just don't know that we're uh, ready yet. Where do we stand on algae being converted into gasoline? EPA has uh, qualified algae as a feedstock to meet the renewable fuel standards as a cellulosic. I know that there are significant efforts by a number of companies, in including ExxonMobil, on algae research. Uh, I don't know to what extent these efforts will allow them to bring a commercial available material in the marketplace anytime soon. And so do we have any idea what, what level of uh, production we have at this point? I don't believe there is any uh, commercial available algae material for the do transportation sector. Do we have any sector. expectation of uh, production by, say, 2015 or 2020? At I, don't, I don't know, sir. So to be putting our money on algae at this point, although it certainly should be researched, would be a, a foolish bet for the next 15 or 20 years. Is that a fair statement? Um, I, I'm in no position to say that. Uh, you know, again, you know, a lot of resources are spent uh, by a, a lot of uh, companies. Maybe uh, Ms. Hogan can speak to that. But for me to uh, evaluate uh, R&D efforts and to what extent they will materialize in the next five or ten years, I think that's, an appropriate, that's not an appropriate position for me to take. Ms. So Hogan, you the want algal to? resource is certainly a part of our biomass R&D program where we're looking at um, a variety of sort of bio-based sort of starters. Where we are with um, algae is it's part of our drop-in fuels program. That's one of the, the strong areas. Uh, and where we expect is to get to um, sort of cost competitiveness uh, in about 10 years. Cost competitiveness. Competitive with what? Uh, with uh, traditional fuels, gasoline. All right. And we've been talking a lot about, uh, or there have been a lot of talk about electric cars. And, of course, the question asked in my in my part of the world is, how are you going to have all these electric cars if you aren't producing enough electricity? And uh, obviously a big part of our coal or part of our electricity is produced by coal. Um, Mr. Uh, Grunspect, did I, did I get close on that? Very close. Perfect. All right. Um, 
if we keep raising the cost of electricity, don't you think that that will cause uh, some concern or some uh, diminution in the uh, advantages to going to an electric car? Uh, I think uh, my understanding is that the cost of electricity, once you have the electric vehicle, is very attractive relative to the cost of uh, gasoline or diesel. The question with the electric vehicle is the cost of the electric vehicle. Right. But part of the advantage of the electric vehicle is, is that once you start using it, you have lower costs. But just today, a part of my district got noticed that their electric bill was going to go up because of uh, innovations made at a new coal-fired power plant. And of course, that's state of the art, but there won't be any more of those built because we're going to shift the country away. And just yesterday, we had a hearing where the, the president of uh, uh, or CEO of Dominion uh, Power indicated that one of the ways they've been able to keep costs down for their customers is having a wide diversity of different ways to produce their electricity, and now coal is being taken away from him, away from them in that mix, and they don't think that's going to work for the American consumers, and they believe electric costs are going to go up. And in fact, Kentucky utilities indicated 10 to 14 percent uh, in our region is going to be an increase in just based on new regulations uh, from the EPA. So when you start raising the cost of that electricity up, you're really going to d damage that uh, value, are you not? And I see my time is up, and I yield back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Gardner, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for your time and participation in today's hearing. Uh, Dr. Hogan, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy Efficiency, what does that, what does that entail? Just a brief uh, one-sentence job description. Uh, just overseeing our energy efficiency, R&D, and um, deployment portfolio. And when you research, study energy efficiency projects, uh, what do you take into account, uh, aside from the energy efficiency aspect itself? Certainly, we are looking to find um, cost-effective opportunities to improve efficiency of our homes, our buildings, our transportation systems, and our industry. Do you take into account jobs that would be affected by those cost of the energy efficiency measures? We are very interested in um, strategies that we can advance that will help build domestic jobs, jobs that cannot be um, exported overseas. Do you take into account jobs that could be lost as a result of some of the measures that you're considering? I think we try to look holistically at um, how to have a robust um, you know, set of jobs in the energy efficiency field. And uh, obviously, the, my district in Colorado has a large uh, agricultural base. It's the 11th largest agricultural district out of the 435 districts in Congress. A lot of corn growers are very concerned about what's taking place around the country today. Uh, and I just got an email today from a farmer in Colorado who asked this question. And I'll read the, the question to you. It says, hearing talks about the EPA relaxing the ethanol mandate due to corn shortage. What are you hearing? And I know you've addressed this a couple of times. So. Uh, is the EPA, do you have the statutory authority, are you considering a relaxing the ethanol mandate due to the corn shortage? I think I'm going to share this one with my uh, colleague. Uh, I'm EPA. Um, we are hearing the rumors also. Uh, clearly, uh, there is concern that has been raised because of the drought, so we have been in discussions with our colleagues from USDA. Uh, what we are hearing, actually, although the yield USDA has lowered the yield by 10 percent. There are more acres uh, and, and more corn produced this year than it was produced last year. And actually, this year is we're going to have, based on the USDA data, uh, the third highest uh, corn production in the record of the country. Now, uh, the um, ESA, uh, the Congress passed in 2007, uh, provides opportunity for uh, companies that are regulated under this law, including state governors uh, to, to petition EPA to waive uh, the volume of the renewable fuel standards based on uh, lack of availability of renewable fuels and significant um, uh, cost impacts to the region or the state. Uh, we have not seen any petitions today. If we receive a waiver, there is a process that the agency has, which is a 90-day process to put the waiver out for comments uh, and public, uh, potentially public hearing, and we'll act accordingly. 
So there is no right. So there is there's, there's, there's no consideration at this point. Absolutely not. Okay. And Dr. Gruenspecht, if, if I could ask you this question about hydraulic fracturing, uh, what do you know what percentage of our energy production, oil or gas production, is uh, developed or achieved through hydraulic fracturing? Well, I know that we are producing, excuse me, I know that we're producing uh, more than a third of our natural gas now from shale gas, and I think all of that uh, involves fracturing, and there may be some fracturing additionally in some of the uh, oil production and some of the other gas production. So I imagine it's pretty significant. Well, could you get back to me with specific numbers? You have one third Absolutely. on natural gas, and then on the oil side, I'd be interested as well, because there's a lot of fracturing, uh, hydraulic fracturing occurring in my district, uh, including oil and gas development. Uh, could you, one third of natural gas, could you also quantify the impact if uh, hydraulic fracturing were to be restricted? Do you know the number off the top of your head, what that would mean? I don't know off the top of my head, could but you, uh, uh, run the, try run to do a, that. Uh, could you get it back to us? Thank you. Yep. I'll yield back my time. Gentlemen, yields back, balance of his time. Uh, there are no further members for questions, so that will conclude today's hearing. Once again, we thank you. We appreciate you all being with us. We appreciate your testimony. And uh, during the question and answers, there was some commitment on your part to provide some additional information, which we would appreciate. And we will keep the record open for a period of 10 days for any other material that might be inserted. And with that, we will conclude today's hearing. Thank you very much.